Uh, a question for you this day is uh, how many of you have intentionally, whether it be the opening ceremony or any of the events, have watched any of the Olympics since it started, right? Almost every hand in here will go up, right? I love the Winter Olympics. Uh, I was always kind of a winter sport kind of guy. When I was younger, believe it or not, I used to uh, go to Colorado two, three times a year and ski, and I uh, lo always loved skiing. From the first time I skied, I was 16, and uh, just fell in love with it and skied regularly. I was in a ski club, and I actually raced too. I used to race uh, these NASCAR, not NASCAR, but NASCAR courses as well, which are basically the slalom courses that you see on the Olympics. And I have to be honest, I, I, there was no fear. I'd, the steeper, the better, the faster, the better. It was a blast in those days, right? Today, it's a little different, just saying. But, uh, you know, when you're up there on these mountains and you're just seeing the beauty and you're skiing fast and you're having fun, there was always one thing that intimidated me a little bit. Not every mount, but some mountains would have ski jumps, right? Ski jumps. And I don't know if you've ever taken a close look at these things, but I'm telling you, to imagine being at the top of one of those and looking down and knowing that you're going to be catching that much air, I was like, there's no way I could ever do that. Not on these big jumps that they have. Anyways, Gretchen and I last night were watching the ski jumping competition on the Olympics, and it's amazing to think that these people do that. And, it, you know, cameras don't always give us a true picture, but the one camera angle that, that kind of does is, is uh, with the ski jumping is they'll have the camera at the top of the ski jump and they'll point it down it and you can see that what these get, people are going down as they jump. And I'll be honest, it strikes a little bit of uneasiness in me, a little bit of fear in my bones, you might say, to think, wow, I could never do that. You know, there are different things in our lives that cause fear, and you might even say there's different kinds of fear, right? Some of the fear we get is an adrenaline rush when we do something like ski jumping, but then there's the other fear that is, well, outside influence, you might say, on us. And we see some of that in our readings for today, especially the Old Testament reading and the Gospel reading. The people were fear in fear. And, for instance, in the Old Testament reading, you've got Moses. Now, we had a short reading where Moses goes up, he's visiting with God, and when he comes down, his face shines, right? and it struck fear in the people. But every story has a context. In the context of this story, there's a reason these people ought to be afraid of God, okay? Because just a few chapters before, Moses had gone up, been in conversation with God. God had given him the tablets of the Ten Commandments. And while they were in conversation, the people down low, well, they grew restless, taking Moses a little bit too long. They convinced their priest, Aaron, that, hey, you know, it'd be a good idea for us to make a God of our own. Let's make a God. And so they collected all of their gold and the like, and they smelted it, and they made a golden calf. And they began to worship this image made by the hands of men. And that infuriated the one true God. He told Moses that the people were wretched, they were doing something that was terrible, and Moses went down, and when he saw it, he threw those tablets down, they broke into pieces, and he was full of rage himself, Literally, they ground that golden calf up. The people were made to drink it. And then it was interesting because Moses then pleaded for God not to pour out his absolute wrath on these people and wipe them off the face of this earth. And God relented. But they were fearful. As a matter of fact, we read in chapter 33 before our reading for today, um, God said this to them. He said, Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. Now that might sound like gospel. God's forgiven and forgotten and it's all good. Go to the land I promised you flowing with milk and honey. But then he says, But I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. And when the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned. They were scared. God, basically, at one point, they had removed themselves from God, but God had always had his presence among him, them, and now God was saying, I'm departing from you. And that struck fear in them. 
And so as Moses went up and he visited with God, he would come out and his face would shine and they knew he'd been in the presence of God. And what kind of word is Moses going to bring us from God? And Moses, interestingly enough, he'd go up, his face would shine, the people would be in fear, and he would proclaim what God had told him to reveal to the people. And then he'd go back up and he'd come down and they'd be in fear because they'd see his face shining and he'd proclaim the word that God told him to reveal to the people. And this cycle went on. In the gospel reading for today, we see a similar thing. We see a similar thing because um, you've got Jesus and he takes the three insiders, Peter, James, and John. They go up to a high mountain place. And in that place, Jesus is transfigured. And he begins to shine. It says his clothing was so white that nothing could clean it that clean. And, and so Jesus' divine glory is expressed among them. And then, all of a sudden, there's Moses and Elijah. Now, there are so many questions around this story that it's unbelievable. Why is it that this story of the transfiguration is so important? As a matter of fact, you may remember, I know I've told you before that when I was preparing to go to undergrad to be a youth minister, to be a DCE, um, I was given an opportunity in my home congregation to teach, to fill in for a class one day. Well, the teacher couldn't be in that class that day, and, uh, and uh, they asked me if I'd fill in, and, and I, in one of my moments of wisdom, I said, what's the topic? And they said, well, the transfiguration. And I responded and said, no, I think I'll pass on that one, right? Because there's so many unanswered questions. Why did all this unfold the way it does? What were Moses and Elijah and Jesus talking about? We don't know. But here's what we do know. We know that those three, Peter, James, and John, were struck with fear. As a matter of fact, our text for today said that, that uh, Peter says, hey, it's good that we're here, Jesus, so let me build a tent for you and Moses and Elijah. Just hang out here. And it says that they didn't know what to say because they were, struck, they were terrified. They were terrified in the presence of God. Here's the reality of the situation in both circumstances. Sinners are terrified when they're in the true presence of God. Sinners are always going to be terrified if they're in the true presence of God. That's the reality, the harsh reality. Um, you know, many of you know I just got back from Haiti. Uh, on Tuesday, I got back from Haiti, and, and uh, it was another great trip. You know, a variety of ministry things happened. I led a pastor's conference for three days and the like, and yeah, and then one day we went to a place called Sejane. Now, Sejane is a, a village that you can only reach by foot, okay? You drive in, you leave the vehicle, and then you have to hike into the village. It's a pretty good little trek to get there. Uh, there's two paths. You can take the easy path that's a little longer. You can go the hard one over a, a hilltop to get there. And it's pretty extreme climbing and the like. But anyways, uh, so it, Sejane is amazing. It, Pastor Greg spent like five days in the village ministering in and amongst the people, staying in their old church and the like. But you can see their new sanctuary they're building, and they're building it on the mountaintop. And you can see it from a great distance. And I'm like, they need to call that place Zion Lutheran Church, right? Because it's on this mountaintop. And so we hike in and we go, and, and you can just basically see the impoverished nature of the people, where they live and the like, and, and the old church, which is basically sticks and tarps, and then this beautiful uh, church that they're building, you go up in it, and you're at the very top, and when you peer out the windows, I kid you, you have the most beautiful, pristine landscape with mountains and the Caribbean Ocean in the distance, and it's amazing. And then you turn, and you look down, and you see, and you realize that you're in the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, you know? Well, to get into this place, as I said, you go and you park in this town. This town's name is Beaumont. We would say Beaumont, like Beaumont, Texas. And, and so uh, in driving in there, we drove past this construction site. And it was a narrow road. The road was kind of blocked with all their stuff. And they, there were like 40 Haitians there. They had music playing, and most of the people were watching while the others worked and the like. They moved the stuff out of the way so we could get through and get to our spot, go into Sejane. We did our visit in Sejane. We left. We were coming back through. 
they were there again the road was blocked with all the stuff that they were using portland cement and the like and uh, they moved it out of the way but our driver in that moment decided to stop and start visiting with one of these guys what he didn't realize was that all of us in the back of the vehicle and we were packed in there like sardines were being approached by all these guys and they were, a lot of them were up to no good. They were saying all kinds of stuff we couldn't understand. They were speaking in Creole. A lot of times they're asking for money, they're asking for this. And you could just see the gang mentality starting to set up, right? And so I had my arm out the window of this vehicle because we were so crunched in there. And, and one of the guys reached out for a handshake, you know? And I thought, well, I'll shake his hand. He had a big smile and all. That was my mistake because when I shook hands with him, I realized his hand was soaking wet. And I took my hand into the vehicle, and I watched him walking away, and he pointed, and he laughed, you know, and he was pointing at me, and all of a sudden my hand started to burn. I don't know what he had on his hand. I do know this. I smelled it. I thought maybe it was kerosene or gas or something, right? I, I smelled it, and in that moment, I was struck with fear. I thought, what has this guy done to me, right? And so I told the people I was with, all the people in the vehicle, I said, he's got something on his hand. I don't know what it was. And they gave me some wipes, and I wiped it off, and then I took some, a lot of the gel, the sterile gel, and clean. Fortunately, everything was okay, right? But in that moment, I realized that these guys were up to no good, and they were surrounding our vehicle. And I was struck with a little bit of fear. As a matter of fact, one of the people in the vehicle looked at our driver and said, you're having a conversation while the rest of us are being mugged. Get out of here, right? And we got out and everything was okay. What strikes fear in you? I mean, really, in this world, what strikes fear in your life? Fear, you can equate it with anxiety, you might say, and Sometimes we walk in anxiety and sometimes it's just outright fear. But what is it that stirs that up in you? For some of you, I know that we walk with so many people in the life of St. Peter and we have people that come and pray with us. I'm not sure I'm going to have a job next week. Over the holidays, over Christmas, I can't tell you how many people came to us and said they had been laid off. Does that strike fear in you may your company's cutting down divisions they're doing this and maybe you'd be late, late, one of the ones to come or maybe is it illness you know cancer runs in your family everybody in your family's had cancer and then all of a sudden you start to feel ill and you're wondering oh my goodness could it be me or is it just lack of control when we recognize that in this life there are just things we can't control and for some of us well, it strikes anxiety, it strikes fear. What is it? See, in the text today that we read, these people weren't fearful of all those things. They were fearful of God. Do we fear God? I might even ask, should we fear God? I'm going to answer that question here in a little bit. Because, see, there's really good news. There's really good news, and we see it unfolded in these readings for today. As a matter of fact, I mentioned earlier that Moses had pleaded with God that his wrath would not be poured out on the people, and God relented and the like. And the neat thing is, when Moses came down from the mountain, and as he spoke to the people, and he, they were in fear. They saw his face shining, and he would proclaim the word of God, and then what did he do right after that? He put a veil over his face. He didn't want the people to know and live in fear of God, but he wanted them to know uh, that God was there, he was with them, and that there should be no fear. There's no fear in a God who loves us. And with uh, the transfiguration experience with Peter, James, and John, literally the text in Matthew tells us they went to their faces, they went to the ground. And I love what Jesus does. After everything had happened, it says, but Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. They saw no one but Jesus only. And what were his words? Rise and have no fear. 
And it's really at this moment that maybe Jesus in his human nature should have had some fear because the one thing we do know about the transfiguration in the Gospels is is from this point forward that his eyes are set on Jerusalem and he knew his destiny was going to be death on a cross. It was all downhill from there. They left that mountaintop of the transfiguration. They went down, and Jesus journeyed to his destiny, you might say. And he was lifted up once more, was he not? He was lifted up on the cross. He was lifted up to his place of death. And he journeyed there for you and me. It was all downhill for Jesus, and that's a good thing. Isn't that what we call it in Holy Week, Good Friday? The day when Jesus literally took our sins, took the fact that we deserve eternal death because we too have turned from God and worshiped the things of this world. But God relented and sent his son to death on a cross, bearing the burden of our sins. And you might say in that moment, Jesus, through his actions, put a veil over our sins, a veil over our sinful nature so that when God sees us, he sees us as his beloved children. We're beloved children of God because, well, he took care of sins for us. And not only that, when Jesus was placed in the tomb, three days later he rose and gave us a beautiful promise that not only does God see us as his children, but he sees us as people worthy to be with him for all eternity. So when we look to God, are we struck with fear? Well, we can never live up to the laws of God, but Jesus has taken care of that for us. We just get on our knees in repentance, and as we do so, we know our God of grace and love, the God who veiled over our sins through the death of his Son, Jesus Christ. You might say it's all downhill for us from here, and it's a good thing, you know. In this life, I can't ski like I used to. My body gets older and, well, there are just things I can't do anymore that I used to be able to. And we can look at it like that and say, you know, in my youth I could do a lot and today I can't. It's all down from here. But that's a good thing because God grows us and matures us. And as we read in the epistle reading that we're being transformed as God's children, are we not? And one day... When God calls us home, we'll be with him forever. And we're promised that Jesus will come again and all the dead will rise and we'll be once again transformed, you might say, transfigured physically in the eternal glory of our God of all grace. In that there's no fear, just love. So we live. We live life in this world and one of the harsh realities is truly that there are those things that well, cause us fear, cause us anxiety. But we lean on the grace and love of our Lord. We lean on the fact that he's given us his Holy Spirit, give us strength to, well, endure through these times of trial. And maybe we echo with the words of Paul. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.